Celebrating 46 years on the air, award-winning Farm Week is a production of Mississippi State University Extension. Today on Farm Week, a summer weather update, another derecho hits Iowa, thousands without power. Plus, with continuing evolution in technology, are new rules for drones on the way? In Southern Gardening, tomato or tomato, taste is everything, and Gary has the DIY. And finally, in our feature, another chance to meet the reigning logger of the year. Farm Week starts right now. Hello everyone, I'm Zach Ashmore. And I'm Mike Russell. Good to have you with us on Farm Week as we continue our 46th season on the air. Jonah Holland on set with us, ready to bring you this week's Newswire. Jonah? Thanks, Mike. An abbreviated Newswire this week, let's jump right in. The nation's top food distributor has filed suit in federal court against the big four meatpacking companies alleging price fixing. In a case that continues to put pressure on packers, Cisco filed in late June saying that Tyson, JBS, Cargill and National Beef, who control 80% of the U.S. beef market, intentionally narrowed the supply chain and thereby boosted prices. Cisco is not the first to sue the big four and at the same time Congress is pushing two bills intended to heighten oversight and accountability. Activity in this case begins in September. High heat in the nation was broken up by storms in several states. The rain was welcomed by most farmers, but the wind left its mark on crops in nearly a dozen states. A strong storm stirred up a derecho in South Dakota, Minnesota, and Iowa last week. Thousands of customers were without power as downed trees littered the region. By week's end, power was restored. The storm met the definition of a derecho with a damaged path of more than 240 miles and straight line wind gusts of nearly 60 miles an hour. Thousands of acres of corn were flattened in all three states as a result of the storm. And while some will continue to grow, there will be lower yields and the crop will be difficult to harvest. Elsewhere, a small tornado struck suburban Cincinnati. 200 homes were damaged in the area and 100,000 customers lost power. That system's heavy rain was little relief for most of the country, which saw the drought worsen in many states. 15% of the Midwest is now affected by drought, double that of a week ago. The western third of the country continues to experience extensive drought. With all of the shortages Americans are now facing, some are worried almonds could be the next hard to find item on their shopping lists. Exports of the popular nut are down 13%, this despite the crop doing well and shipments hitting a new record. The LA Times reports more than a billion pounds of unsold almonds are stuck in processing. Experts say while shipping costs have improved, they're still high. The industry is also worried that ongoing drought in parts of California could impact its harvest. And that's it for this week's Newswire. Have a great week, everyone. Mike? Crop scouting is nothing new, but the tools to speed up the process are. The use of drone technology is limited by federal rules, but Dave Miller reports on possible changes and the impact they would have on the industry. Crop scouting with a drone isn't a new concept. Pilots have been sending their unmanned aerial systems into the air over rural America for almost a decade. By law, pilots must be able to see their aerial vehicles from liftoff to touchdown. That is, until now. As of early July, 230 waivers have been granted by the FAA, allowing drones to fly out of line of sight of their pilots. These exemptions include the inspection of high voltage power lines, the tracking of endangered sea turtles, and the inspection of railroad lines from New Jersey to locations out west. That's, uh, we're trying to push the Arthur road. Erickson so is the CEO of like, Helio, a company that creates turnkey UAV solutions for autonomous crop spraying. Like a lot of new industries, uh, the regulations are, I would say, about 15 or 20 years behind where the technology actually is. And by that, I mean, 15 years ago, when the FAA made these, these regulations, they treated drones a lot like they treat just traditional manned aviation. 
But nowadays, drones are so advanced and so robust and intelligent that it makes a lot of sense to allow them to just go out and operate without pilot intervention. There's about four or five big regulations that we're kind of all waiting for, by we I mean the drone industry, to, to pass or, or become looser, for lack of a better word. And like every time you, you actually get one of these regulations overturned by the FAA or allowed, as in like allowing flight for beyond visual line of sight, it opens the fire hose up like a little bit more. Fire hose being like demand to buy like ag drones or spray drones. The FAA is still reviewing how it will roll out routine operations, although it has signaled permission will be reserved for commercial applications and not for hobbyists. Tomatoes are one of the most commonly grown plants in Mississippi and across the U.S. for that matter, popular for all sorts of reasons, not the least of which is taste. In Southern Gardening this week, Gary Bachman shows how to choose a variety that fits your garden no matter how big or small. Here's Gary. I have to say, my spring crop of tomatoes are looking good this year. Let's take a look at the various selections I'm growing in my home garden. Each year at the Heritage Cottage Urban Nano Farm, I grow a variety of different sizes of tomatoes, from micros to determinants to indeterminate varieties, always trying to get the best production I can. I also grow different colors from red, orange, black, and also striped selections. Micro tomatoes are perfect for even the smallest areas. These plants are great for space-challenged gardeners, growing a whole tomato plant in a small pot. They are genetically selected for their small, compact size and are much smaller than their giant garden cousins. Micro Tom is the world's smallest tomato at a mere six to eight inches tall with bright red fruit. Determinant varieties grow to a set mature size of about four to six feet tall, and the fruit ripens over a period of about six weeks in my garden. These are perfect for the gardener who has a couple of plants growing in containers on the back patio. Indeterminate selections continue to grow and set fruit as long as there are favorable growing conditions. These can grow into big plants, up to eight feet and taller, so you need to allow space for what can eventually become a sprawling plant. You may even need a ladder. As you can see, there's a type of tomato for any gardener and gardening space. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman. We'll see you next time on Southern Gardening. We'll take a break right here, but don't go away. Coming up, another chance to meet the reigning logger of the year. Forestry, a major commodity, of course, and this year's winner, a major player in the, in the industry. The company's been around for 70 years, and naturally, logging's changed, but travel with us to Purvis, Mississippi, to meet the father-son team keeping up with the times, contributing to a $13 billion economic footprint. The 2021 logger of the year, coming up on Farm Week. Don't go away. I believe in people and their hopes, their aspirations and their faith. I believe in my own work and in the opportunity I have to make my life useful to humanity. I believe that education is a lifelong process and the greatest university is the home. That my success as a teacher is proportional to those qualities of mind and spirit that give me welcome entrance to the homes of the families that I serve. Because I believe these things, I am an extension professional. in people and their hopes, their aspirations and their faith. I believed that education, of which extension work is an essential part, is basic in stimulating individual initiative, self-determination and leadership. I believe
believe that these are the keys to democracy and that people, when given facts they understand, will act not only in their self-interest but also in the interest of society. I believe in intellectual freedom to search for and present the truth without bias and with courteous tolerance towards the views of others. Because I believe these things, I am an extension professional. Time for the market report, a bit of a rebound. That's right, Mike, and inflation seems to be the reason. We'll be getting into it, but first, the numbers slowly trickling back up, then the reason why. And finally, an update on the U.S. crop situation. Three farmers from around the country weigh in. Markets trending up last week. Looks like the downturn is a seeing a slight correction. Let's take a look. Last week's biggest loss, cotton down 1.85 cents based on what we know. It seems the reason is a continuing back and forth between supply and demand. Last week's biggest gain, wheat up 47 and a quarter cents. It's followed by lumber at $45 and corn at 18 cents. So, Tuesday last week, the markets took another drop. Yet, as the week went on, they began to rebound. Why? Well, according to market analyst Ted Seifert, it was the markets being unsure of inflation prices. It's the fragile balance of supply and demand, and this time it looks like the result is growing prices. They just, uh, the, the switch kind of flipped after Tuesday, meaning uh, the selling pressures had subsided, and that selling pressure wasn't necessarily coming from weather, although that did have a part of it on, on Tuesday, uh, but it was this inflation off, you know, like, we, like we've talked about. Inflation off has been running rampant uh, for the past two weeks. It came in on Tuesday, but then Wednesday they weren't really doing it, and the markets were kind of quiet. Thursday we were kind of poking at it to see if they were going to do it, and we started climbing, and they didn't. And then Friday we really kind of were able to run with it a little bit. So the question is, uh, is this an inflation off trade, is it done? Uh, what was that two weeks about? I mean, did they achieve their mission and then now are stepping back? Have they changed their minds? Or was this a period of time where they realized the markets are very oversold, and I'm not just saying corn or soybeans or crude, really all of them, saying, all right, these markets are really oversold, let's take a pause, allow them to recover a little bit before we unleash round two. I don't know. I don't know the answers to that. Uh, we're going to find out fairly <laughs> early next week, I think. Um, but it was nice to see that recovery. You had corn and soybeans kind of recover right to the key areas that you would expect uh, 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 a corrective bounce to get to. They actually closed right at or just above uh, key resistance points that were just recently key support points. It was a good look to the chart at the end of the day on Friday. But like I said, next week is going to be very telling. With the market situation so tenuous right now, a lot of pressure on U.S. farmers to step up. So, how do things look in ag country right now? Well, three farmers from around the country let us know. Like our wheat crop was just super dry um, all winter, all spring. At the end of May, we had 10 and a half inches over two weeks, two and a half weeks. Uh, you know, a lot of our crops thought they were back, you know, where you are in Iowa or Indiana or, you know, thought this, these growing conditions were just great and they were not working on a root system whatsoever. And then as typical, the Kansas heat, and the Kansas wind hit them and it was rough on some, some places. I mean, the corn was turning yellow. It didn't have a root system. It couldn't get to the water. It just looked like it was just, uh, it looked like a major drought. But even though, like, you know, four inches down, there was all the moisture it needed. It just hadn't rooted down into it yet. And, uh, but I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's doing better now. So we, uh, you know, had that snowstorm and, and then we received significant precipitation throughout the rest of April and into the middle part of May that really delayed drills and planters and everyone's field work um, significantly th throughout our whole state. Um, from our standpoint, we, we really thought around Memorial Day weekend that we were going to have at least 25% of our farm and prevent plant, that there was just no way we were going to get into it. We missed a major system that went through um, just about 20 miles to the east that started raining and we missed that and really was pretty fortunate for our farm. Uh, we ended up getting close to 95% uh, planted and seeded. Our progress is looking pretty good. We're just, you know, very hot, dry, uh, 
you know, it's a few little isolated areas. They've gotten some pop-up showers in the past 10 days, um, but we're seeing a lot of stress coming on in this in this crop. Um, you know, soybeans are that are not irrigated. We're starting to see them go the other way. You're seeing them flare up in the fields, the hot spots show up. Kind of, I'm a little worried about the rice crop too. We're fixing to start hitting pollination on rice, and we we need those nighttime temperatures to get down. You know in the mid 70s not to affect the pollination issues on it so that that's kind of a concern on it a lot of the cotton is really suffering you know i've seen around we everybody was like we were really late getting planted this year on, in some areas so you know we got some beans planted early then we got some later beans and the other thing is we got a lot of double crop beans this year falling wheat that are very small and the guys that don't have pivot irrigation you know, are trying to fur irrigate soybeans that are just, you know, second trifoliant. And, you know, that's kind of tricky to do, not to, to hurt them with water and scald them. At the best, we're going to come out as an average crop. And that's it for a deeper look into the markets. Next week, we'll talk about the July WASDE report and its fallout. Mike? Thanks, Zach. Good to see what's happening around the country. In this week's feature, another chance to meet the reigning logger of the year, a father and son team contributing to a multi-billion dollar forestry footprint, made possible in part by Holcomb Timber. <music> There's no question that the forests of Mississippi are among the most breathtaking natural resources in the state. Nearly 20 million acres are wooded, and besides being a source of pride, beauty, and recreation, the trees harvested in Mississippi represent an extraordinary industry. In fact, forestry had an economic impact of more than $13 billion last year, even more amazing considering that 2020 was the year of the pandemic. The loggers who made all that possible are a critical part of the backbone of that industry, which is why every year the Mississippi Forestry Association honors the outstanding logger of the year. In 2021, that logger is Holcomb Timber of Purvis, Mississippi. And as you might expect, there was a lot to consider when making the choice. Dave Godwin of the MFA sums it up. We look at safety. Uh, Holcomb has had an impeccable safety track record and placed a lot of emphasis on, emphasis on safety. We look at their approach to business. And in 2021, the business of logging is very complicated and complex. And their business model, their business strategy has been excellent. It's helped them excel in the business space in 2021. And um, we look at how they care for the environment, how they use best management practices uh, to care for the natural resources and protect the natural resources on the land that they're working on. They've done a great job with that. And then we look at their engagement and involvement in the community, the local and state community. And Holcomb has done a great job of being involved in the community uh, in multiple ways. So they check a lot of boxes for us. The Mississippi Forestry Association is proud to recognize Holcomb Timber Company from Purvis, Mississippi. It's our 2021 Outstanding Logger of the Year. Holcomb Timber has been around for almost 70 years, a multi-generational logging company owned by Art Holcomb and his father Roland. Like many logging companies, it's a family business. Like most, it's in their blood. Growing up with, with my dad out here doing it, I remember coming out here as a kid and we'd be able, of course it was a lot different then, the equipment was much different. But just uh, working for yourself maybe, you know, the drive to, to really try to be successful. And sometimes sometimes it's it's hard. There are weeks, there there there's there's months where it's it's really hard to get there. But then there's months where you do really well and you and you see it, you know, you see it picking up and doing good. I guess it's maybe it's a chase. Maybe it's a chase that gets into you. Uh, trying to drive a profit maybe. Multi-generation companies is something that we see a lot of in logging families which is is often what draws us to them. It's, it's what the story is about and it's really neat when you see folks like Mr. Roland, Mr. R and how they uh, have continued a family business and are able to take things that are really important to landowners such as stream crossings, best management practices and the way that they treat the property uh, and continue that generation after generation. They just do a first-class job at it. 
Yeah. But when y'all are able to get back in there and get that pine. Holcomb Timber was nominated for Logger of the Year by two men from Weyerhaeuser, Jeff Roman Clayton IV, their harvest manager, and Christopher Longman, their forester. Both men have great respect for Holcomb. It's not the first time they've nominated the company, and this time their efforts paid off. They're a very consistent crew. Um, that's important for us. You know, we've got commitments that we need to hit, and just being able to put them on a track and know that they're going to handle it right, you know, safety, environmental, merchandising, and, and then it comes to the wood flow consistency. It's, it's very important for us. Um, you know, we, we make pretty large commitments with our customers, and we don't like to disappoint. So having a crew that's consistent that you can depend on and that can do some things when the weather, you know, changes, uh, it's, it's very, very uh, useful for us. I think the thing that really sets Holcomb apart uh, is the way that they go about merchandising. They're able to really get the most value out of every stick of timber in ways that most loggers can't, and they can do it without sacrificing their dedication to safety uh, and, and all of the environmental aspects that, that go with making a sustainable logging crew. Um, another thing that really sets them apart is that it's a family crew. Uh, you know, there's, there's three generations of Holcombs out here. Uh, and, and they're easy to work with. Um, I think they're going to be around for a long time, just like they've been a big part of you know this industry in South Mississippi for a long time, up until now. Um, but you know they, they do things professionally, and they understand why it matters to do it the right way and what that looks like. Like Longman made clear, safety is paramount at every Holcomb job site. The company hasn't had a lost time accident since the late 80s, an impressive achievement. You got to pay attention to your safety, but uh, now it's not as, as unsafe as it used to be because we, there's nobody on the ground out here. I mean, everybody's in a cab or in some kind of machinery, and it's, it's not near as unsafe uh, as it was in the past. And, uh, but we do have to watch what we're doing, make sure who's around, what's going on, keep an eye on yourself, keep an eye on everybody else, make sure everything's safe. Communication, communication when a man's on the ground out here, that's big time. We really want them to have it on their mind all the time when they're out walking around, because I've got two older guys out here that's, you know, a slip and fall, a, a turn of the ankle, you know, you overheating, uh, stuff like that. It, it's just communication, keeping an eye on everybody, Keep an eye on the older guys, you know, keep an eye on the younger guys. They think they're going to live forever. We strive to be as safe as possible, not take any unnecessary risk. The whole job is, itself is risky, but there's no sense in doing something that you know is dangerous. We, we have monthly safety meetings. Uh, myself, I am a first responder. I've been with the fire department for 16 years, so I have medical training in case something does happen. Of course, there are plenty of challenges for the logging industry. Cost, weather, insurance, the availability of labor, and of course, wood prices. But the industry is doing well, and so is Holcomb Timber. Loggers who succeed where many others sometimes don't and have gone out of business. Everything is pretty much against a logger if you put it on paper. And uh, it's hard, you have to Margin is short, margin is small. You have to do everything right to be profitable. And these guys show that it can be done by working together. It's an example of, of a really dedicated firm that does really good work, and that's what we're looking for. That's what, that's what a logger year should be. I mean, they're conscientious, they follow BMPs, they, they really work with the landowners they deal with and the foresters they deal with to make sure they're, they're meeting the requirements you know, that, that the, the sale has. And, and they're, they're just, they're, they adapt to a lot of different situations. Bottom line, Holcomb Timber represents the best in logging. Its position at the top in 2021 is one all logging companies aspire to. It operates with integrity, skill, efficiency, and passion. And as such, honored as the MFA's Outstanding Logger of the Year. All the men out here working and our truck drivers, they're the one that's got this. They're the one... They all do their job, do it well, and they're the reason why we're here. That's the reason why we're successful. You can't just do it by yourself. We come to work every day, and we're early getting here, and we work extremely hard, and we're providing 
a ton of stuff for these mills, you know, as far as our natural resources, because Mississippi has a, an abundant amount, and we're, we're getting it there. We're doing it in a safe manner, and I, I hope people know that we're, we're doing it with a, with a, in a respectable manner, because they come right back in, and they replant this stuff, and we'll be back in here in 25 years to hopefully get it again. Congrats again to Holcomb Timber, 2021 Logger of the Year. Well, next week, they're man's best friends, but most of them are out of work now. We're not talking about farm dogs, but greyhounds. They love to run, but with most states banning dog racing, they could wind up on a farm. Adoption is the name of the game. We're off to the heartland at a nonprofit that's relocated thousands of retired racers. There's a lot more to this story, though. We double dog dare you to watch next time on Farm Week. And before we go, as we record this show, McDonald's and Wendy's are both giving away free fries this week in honor of National French Fry Day. Lots of potatoes going out the drive-up window. You do need to order your fries through the app at both. You'll get your fries with specific purchases that change each day. The promotion runs all week at both chains. Remember, if you missed a story, look for past episodes of Farm Week on our website at farmweek.tv. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook. We'll see you next week. Thanks for watching.